he was a visionary. He could read the signs of the times, but he wasn't only a visionary, he was also a strategist. Now they say of a prophet, the true prophet is one who loves the nation. And that's what I believe he was, somebody who loved the nation. Remember, he came under a lot of criticism from within the church as well. He came under a lot of criticism from other Christians. His whole philosophy was that you could not be in the church and be blinded by what was happening around you. His uh, outreach to make people aware any form of racism, any form of stigma, was not just against the person or the group, but it was against God himself. When we got the dialogue with the ANC leadership, there were three questions that Archbishop Hurley put to them. One of them was, you talk about nationalizing the mines and the industries. Where are you going to get the people who are going to be able to run them? Where the spirit is, there is freedom. Chose that motto. He could see that that's what South Africa needed, was freedom for people. Not only the youngest ordained bishop in the world at the time, not only the youngest ordained archbishop in the world at the time, Dennis Eugene Hurley, born on November the 9th, 1915 in Cape Town, was not only renowned for his fiery, forceful fight against darkness, but also his glow of warmth and compassion. His parents were both Irish and they came out to South Africa um, towards the end of the last century and um, that was a very important influence on him the you know the Irish sense of um, persecution by the British and the sense of struggling for independence struggling for freedom was kind of in the DNA I think of Hurley his father of course was a lighthouse keeper and had been doing that job for some time, quite a solitary, isolated kind of existence, far away from town. The, you know, the first, the first lighthouse they came to was at Cape Point. And one, one evening when they were saying prayers, he said, um, the, I think the light has gone out. It was just a mischievous thing, you know, and his father was so furious with him that this idea of the light going out was not, not on. But so he had a that powerful experience of light and the significance of light in um, saving lives. Uncle Dennis was our Uncle Dennis. He was, um, there was always great excitement if he came to visit um, the family. He was a big man. Um, we loved him. He had that clear, distinctive voice and laugh. He was fun. As we grew older, we became more and more aware of Uncle Dennis's role in the political world in, um, and also in the church. We were the younger cousins, and I don't remember too much conversation, but we were certainly aware of um, the role Uncle Dennis was playing in the church and in South Africa at that time. There were two incidents that stand out during his high school years that could have contributed to his selfless resolve to a life of piousness and serving. Firstly, he was lost in a cave for about 24 hours whilst on a school picnic in Newcastle. The second was when his father became mentally ill and the family was helped by the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, a Roman Catholic community of priests and brothers. So Dennis went to the, the boys' school and Eileen to the girls' school in the same town. In that high school year, he, uh, he was lost in a cave with two other boys for just under a day. It, it was like, you know, there was a picnic and all, the, all the, the boys went on the picnic and they were allowed to go, you know, some went climbing rocks and some were playing games and so on. And lunch came, everybody noticed that there were three boys missing and they kept shouting every now and then, but nobody heard them. And they were praying and 
Evidently, at that time, Dennis Hurley said that if they got out alive, he would become a priest. What saved them was the fact that Dennis Hurley had borrowed a hat from somebody else for that day. And as he entered the cave, he took off the hat and left it there so, so that it wouldn't be knocked about in the cave. Because, you know, it's a small space and if you've got a hat on, it's going to be a nuisance. And shortly after that, his father had a, a kind of mental breakdown and had to go, you know, away for treatment for about 18 months. And the mother then was left with four children, three boys and a girl, all at school. She had no job. They had no house because they always lived in the lighthouse, whatever accommodation was provided for the lighthouse keeper. And um, they only had the father's pension as a boarded, you know, medically boarded person. So it was an extremely difficult time. And I think another, something else that kind of made Dennis Hurley mature much faster, that now in some way he was responsible now to help with this family and um, an experience of poverty. With a commitment to take up a priestly life, he was sent overseas for studies, which he completed in Rome, the heart of the global Roman Catholic Empire. Immediately after he finished his matric, he went to Ireland um, for his novitiate as a member of the Oblates of Mary Immaculate. And he was there for about just under two years. And at the end of that, he thought he would be going into the next step, which is called the scholasticate, that's the time when they actually do the priestly studies. But a message came from the bishop here, uh, Bishop Henry de Lal, his predecessor, to say, I want him to go to Rome. Uh, Archbishop Hurley was uh, one of the first of the South Africans to go and study overseas to become an oblate priest. Uh, in that process, he undergoes this conversion. So he was really one of the first whites among the clergy, I, I would believe, who had gone through that process. So when he came back from, South, from France and Rome, where he was studying, he already had a, a very different outlook. It was an extremely challenging experience because simultaneously they had all the lectures were in Latin. The language of the house of the institution was French and the language that you had to speak if you went out in the streets and you wanted to understand anything that was going on in town was Italian. And another thing that had a profound influence on him was the um, Mussolini and his fascist, they were called black shirts. Everybody, you know, all the followers of Mussolini wore black shirts, even the little children. And the way they treated the ordinary Italians in the streets and wherever they went rang a bell. He said, that is how we treat black people in South Africa. There was something else happening in Rome at that time which which I think made an impact, and that is the 
the young Christian workers. It was a movement started in the 1920s in Belgium uh, and in the 30s, that's when Hurley, Hurley was studying in Rome in the 1930s, everybody was talking about it. It wasn't in their curriculum, they weren't studying it, but there were talks about the young Christian workers and their methodology. And their methodology is to come together in small groups once a week and to do an exercise which is called See, Judge, Act. Hurley said that is the perfect method, the perfect method for bringing about change. And it's just so simple. See, Judge, Act. Hurley was very impressed by the young Christian workers who were beginning to make an impact on the church. These impressions proved significant in his later years. With the outbreak of the Second World War, Hurley returned to Durban in July 1940, beginning his long association with the cathedral. He was appointed here. This was the first place he came to, Emmanuel Cathedral, as the junior, very much the junior priest on the staff. I first met um, Father Dennis Hurley in 1940. He was a chaplain to the school that I attended, Morris Brothers, and um, he was a curate here at the cathedral. And he looked after the school, he was a chaplain to the school. And he heard my first confession, he gave me my first communion um, in October 1940, and it had been a long, long association with him. He was a great son of the church. He loved the church. He loved the church and he was an excellent clergyman. But if he had to speak up, he was never frightened to speak. As he did in the apartheid era against the government, against apartheid, against separation. He was a, sometimes he was a lone voice crying in the Catholic wilderness. He often bespeaks a man who was solidly rooted in his spirituality didn't ever, ever waver from that, but was able then to express it in a way that, that, that made an impact on the world. And that for me is perhaps the best example. It's a Christ-like example. And, and maybe that's the best way, you know, the incarnate Christ in different places. And that for me was Archbishop Dennis Hurley in many ways. He was a visionary. He could read the signs of the times, but he wasn't only a visionary, he was also a strategist. He had a vision, an ideal, and the first thing he would say is, how do you put that into practice? You know, they say of a prophet, the true prophet is one who loves the nation. And that's what I believe he was, somebody who loved the nation and therefore had to stand up when things were going wrong. The Pope of that time, Pope Pius XI, who was quite a fiery kind of person and he was very angry with Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin and he wrote you know the kind of encyclical letters that popes write about these these three movements Nazism and communism and um, the fascism of, of Italy and that was a very um, it was strong influence for Hurley to see the church speaking out about the way people were being treated. And interestingly, um, in that same place that we're studying, the Gregorian University, was Oscar Romero, a bishop from um, Central America, from El Salvador, who was shot while he was saying mass because of his stand for human rights and justice for the people in El Salvador. At the end of 1946, when he was just 31, Hurley was the youngest Catholic bishop in the world. As he went about the parishes, he heard how much suffering there was as a result of South Africa's racial policies. It took him quite a long time to persuade the other bishops that they should jointly speak out against the many injustices prevalent in South African society. The years that followed saw Hurley invest all his resources within the church and the internal changes it could make. See, judge, act. You talk about 
what you see in society, what, and then judge what you think about it. What does the what do the scriptures say about that? What does this, the gospel say about it? And then act. What are we going to do about it? It was only after Hurley became an archbishop in 1951. Again, he was the youngest in the world, that he was able to persuade the bishops to make their first joint statement against racial discrimination. And the 1950s marked a time when the church took a stand against this growing injustice. He was one of those persons who would be uh, certainly put in the, in the group of progressive, or looking for what would be the best way to bring the church into line with um, in, its, in, its, in its teaching, but also the way it expresses that teaching, in line with what people of today can understand and can accept. And at the same time, be won over to understanding that the Christian teaching has particular things that you need to change your life in order to fit into it. And I think Archbishop Tutu recognized, he said, before I came onto the scene, there was another man and that man was Archbishop Hurley, hmm, who spoke up for, for, for the oppressed people. And that's perfectly true. And a very, very balanced character. Very, very, very balanced. He didn't have extreme views. He always listened to both sides and then acted. He was very decisive. When he acted, he acted decisively. By 1957, a major joint statement about apartheid, largely written by Hurley, described apartheid as intrinsically evil, the strongest possible condemnation in Catholicism. I worked with the Archbishop as a young journalist in private sector, in the media industry, but through my involvement in the catch, through the structures of the Justice and Peace Commission that he led, formed, and um, provided an outlet for young people to be part of the Catholic political life. Um, so that's taught me as a Catholic that we need to be part of the ecumenical faith in this country. And I want to endorse the pivotal role that he played as a leader in our country's democracy. Very few people know about his meeting with the, with the ANC leader Oliver Tambo in London. And thereafter, the delegation that he led, the Catholic Church delegation, the bishops that he led to meet with the ANC a few years later. Remember, he came under a lot of criticism from within the church as well. He came under a lot of criticism from other Christians, feeling that he'd overstepped his, his role as a, a, a faith-based leader. But his, his whole philosophy was that you could not be in the church and be blinded by what was happening around you. Pope John XXIII appointed Hurley to serve on the 101-member Central Preparatory Commission of Vatican II. This took him to Rome in 1962. Archbishop Dennis Hurley was one of the delegates to Vatican II. But he wasn't a silent delegate. He never was. If he felt something had to be said, he said it. And in many ways, Archbishop Hurley lived long before his time. Um, he was already looking to reach out and do things long before it had ever been thought of. Uh, prior to 1965, a Catholic wouldn't even go into another church. Forget about a synagogue or a mosque or even meet with other Christian faith communities, let alone other faiths. With the release of Nostra Aetate, one of the key aspects of that was the outreach to the Jewish community. Although it was the Jews and the Catholics that started first, 
Um, very quickly after that, we saw the Lutherans, the Anglicans, the Methodists, uh, the Presbyterians. And then in 1967, um, the various faith groups that were working together with Religions for Peace International, World Council of Churches, the Islamic Council and that, they started working together and of course in 1970 in Kyoto in Japan um, World Conference on Religions for Peace was founded and Nostra Aetate and, and Vatican II was one of the key areas that helped to put that, put that path right for us and Archbishop Hurley was one of the key people. He was both a, a father or a parent and a child of the Second Vatican Council because he was chosen to be one of a hundred bishops who were on the preparatory committee which prepared for over a year for the, um, for the council. And so he had a good insight into what was going to happen. He already saw that there were two groupings. It was a very progressive grouping and a very conservative grouping. I mean, he, he, sitting next to him in the Central Preparatory Committee was a French bishop who, after Hurley spoke, said, what the Archbishop of Durban has just said is a heresy. So you can see that, the, the, you know, there was kind of daggers drawn there, actually. Um, and, and Hurley was very much on the progressive side. Before the Vatican Council, um, the Catholic Church was really, um, was in a ghetto really. It was a ghetto mentality. And, and I think the greatest experience, he admitted it himself. He said the greatest experience in my, my, my Episcopal life, if not in my whole life, has been the Second Vatican Council. It opened his mind. I'd never associated I had never associated with non-Catholic priests. But after the Vatican Council, we became great friends. We would get together, we would meet together, we'd socialize together. And all that didn't happen in my youth. I mean, I can remember the day when we weren't allowed to even enter into a non-Catholic church. And that changed very much. I think there were a lot of people who didn't like his stance, even within the church. A lot of people say that you know the churches played a role in fact, if you actually analyze it, it was a small part of the church that played a role in the anti-apartheid struggle. The vast majority were in, happy enough for the status quo to, to exist. He seemed fueled by the progressive promises of Vatican II during the late 1960s. And throughout the 70s, and even more so in the 80s, he became known for his prophetic and often also practical leadership. See, judge and act. And that was one of the things that Archbishop Hurley did in the 1970s, very early on, uh, in maybe the 60s already. He sent off Father Albert Danker to go to France to go and learn about this young Christian worker's um, methodology and came back here and formed. And many of the guys who became very active in the anti-apartheid struggle, some of them ended up as ministers in the the government, uh, first uh, apartheid government, uh, post-apartheid government, they'd been through that whole process of see, judge and act of the young Christian workers. He wrote a lot, he wrote a lot, especially in the field of, of um, uh, moral theology. And he was quite controversial there because he was pushing some of the boundaries in uh, quite a lot. Um, I remember one of the arguments would certainly have been around the whole question of contraception, uh, artificial contraception would be one of the areas there. But also in the areas of um, what would be justified, what would not be justified in terms of the armed struggle, he was very strong on that there. I remember accompanying him to Zambia when we, a delegation from the Bishops' Conference went up to meet with the ANC leadership that was in exile. I think it was Archbishop Hurley, Bishop Biase, Father Mkachwa, and myself, I think, with the four of us. And when we got there and got into dialogue with the ANC leadership, there were three questions that Archbishop Hurley put to them, which were really challenging questions. And one of them was, 
You talk about nationalizing the mines and the industries. Where are you going to get the people who are going to be able to run them? Now this is very practical from a churchman and you think that he's, all he's going to come there is talk about good and evil, but he's talking about what you can and cannot do. Archbishop Hurley, welcome to you. My initial thanks for this introduction I have to be brief because time is severely limited, knowing what a good organizer of time Paddy Carney is. But uh, dear Bishop Reuben and dear all of you, kind friends who have the goodness to come here and be with me today, gratitude from my heart. And thank you, Archbishop Wilfred, for your kind introduction and for trying to find something good to say about me. <laughs> teaching at Ananda Seminary, 1971 or 72, I'm not, no, 1971. And um, I read about the commissions that were, you know, the synod that was being held and the commissions that were being set up. And I thought, I'd rather like to be on one of those commissions. So I wrote a letter to his assistant, Father Langlois, and I said I would like to be one of the members of these commissions and I am interested in ecumenism and I'm interested in liturgy and I'm interested in justice and peace. You tell me which one I must join. So back came a letter immediately, you must join justice and peace. And the meeting, the next meeting is on such and such a day and so that's, that's how I got started and then I don't know how long I had been a member, but one, one night, one evening when there was a meeting, Archbishop Hurdy said to me at the beginning of the meeting, at the end of the meeting, I want you to stay back because I want to speak to you. So I thought, ooh, what have I done now? Um, anyhow, at the end of the meeting he said, I'm going to start a new organization and it's going to be called Diaconia and I want you to be the director. Not only committed to a faithful and daily meditation and to the recitation of the divine office, not only committed to the letter and spirit of the Roman Catholic Church, Hurley realized that a body beyond this boundary was needed, and thus was born Diaconia. I'm one of the first staff persons together with Pedi Kani who started the office. Of course, there were serious of discussion with a number of different denominations where they had to actually say, let us start an organization that is going to look into the problems of the people whilst we as churches are going to continue with the pastoral work. So when Diakona was established, our task was to actually bring all the social problems of the people and then report back to the churches. One of the earliest issues we, we dealt with was that the death of Joseph Mbluli, an activist from Le Montville, who died in detention here in Durban. And, you know, we said, this is, that was within like a few days of Diaconia opening its doors. Nobody is saying anything about the death of this de detainee. Let us organize, we called it an evening of reflection on the death of Joseph and Luli, and it was held here. And the, the cathedral was full. 
So it got us off to a good start, but it also put us on the map for the security piece. the arrest of your three colleagues yesterday? Well, uh, we were terribly disappointed at the arrest of our three comrades, uh, especially when we were given an assurance by the uh, Minister Lakhranfi that our representations will uh, be uh, discussed uh, further after the court's judgment. It, uh, they, uh, arrest I came to the University of Natal to study medicine. And I do want to mention that when you arrived at the medical school, a lot of eyes were open to you. This is where it was my first time of being conscientized and actually being able to be told of a situation that had been glaring in my life. As medical students, we were working together and we were not only studying, but we were involved in community struggles. Struggles for detain, you know, fighting for the fact that detainees should be released. And those were the struggles that I think led us to working closely with the Archbishop. You remember there's now a case, I think that's called the Heli, the Heli case, where he actually fought for a particular detainee until the guy was released. You know, some of the other issues that we dealt with at that time were housing and, and forced removals were very much on the, on the map. And of course in Wendelin's a, a big campaign there, um, because, people, you know, that whole, all the people there were going to be moved and was going to be made an area for Indians. And I mean, just the idea was just unbelievable. You know, all that you can imagine the damage that that would do to race relations in South Africa. And, and all these people, those houses would be demolished and then completely new houses with electricity and water and so on would be put up for the Indian community. So we really opposed that and you know, stood with the St. Wendelin's community and we had a, a major service out there with Hurley in the, in the kind of lead role and it, it, it made an impact and St. Wendelin's is still there. People had different ideas about how Christians should behave. So he certainly wasn't the kind of Christian leader that meant, you know, you go to church and you worship. He felt that as a Christian leader, you had to take it outside of the church and make your contribution to society as a whole. And one of his greatest teachings was that around ecumenism and the ecumenical embracing of other religious groups. And I think when I spoke to other religious leaders, certainly from time to time when, when I did attend the dialogues and the discussions at Diaconia, the sense I got was that there was this great admiration and acceptance for this kind of ecumenical approach, which is something he started. Built on the very grounds where an implicitly Catholic, yet defiantly just Hurley, served as a parish priest, stands today the Dennis Hurley Center. Sitting in my office in 2010, Pedi Kani just arrived and said to me, I've got a project that needs to depict the life of a, the, the Archbishop. Would you like to be interested and be part of it? Because I know that you can help me in trying to push it forward. And then I actually said to myself, this is another chance because this is a man you cannot easily forget. This is a man you worked with as a medical student or as a young person within your community. He was a father figure and he showed how committed he was in, fact, in fighting the system that was actually oppressing our communities. The new building with a new vision still retains some of the elements of the old parish. The 106-year-old centre served as St. Augustine's primary school for its first 50 years. Then, it was a space for meetings, workshops, conferences, night schools, when these were illegal, and giving refuge to people during the apartheid years. In more recent years, the Refugee Pastoral Office, as well as the Nkosi Nati Feeding Scheme, and the Usisu Loweto Primary Healthcare Clinic, 
the seeds laid down by Archbishop Dennis Hurley for today's center, built as his legacy. The journey of the Dennis Hurley Center is almost symbolic of the Catholic Church, still very much rooted in its traditions, yet renewed with a warm embrace for all God's children. I remember Paddy Carney coming to me and saying, Mary, we need your help. And uh, my role was to basically take this entire center and his legacy out to the media, which we did, um, and which we made sure that, uh, that the media itself understood the role of the Dennis Hurley Center today. The Dennis Hurley Center is seen to be a unifier much like what he did as a person, as an individual. With regards to his legacy, in the Hurley family, I think education was well inculcated by his parents, by my grandparents. And also another indication of Uncle Dennis's passion for education was the fact that he founded the Kwating Twa School for the Deaf. I'm very delighted to see that education remains a common thread and is one of the tenets of the Dennis Hurley Center. I go there, I see these people. I say I was exactly like them when, when I came there. I was, there was total darkness. To me, it was like my future is destroyed. But the light through Haley had to shine again. That space, to me, it became a, a space where people from different faiths, centers was living empirical evidence that people of different cultures and faiths can live together peacefully. story about how important it is that everyone does a little thing to make the community a better one. The story was about Mrs. Little. She was a good Catholic, so she had about 11 children. And uh, in spite of the fact that most of the children were boys, her house was always thick and spare. And when visitors came along, they'd always ask her, Mrs. Little, how do you possibly achieve this distinction of having such a wonderfully tidy house? Oh, she said, it's very simple. Every little helps. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's the case with the Dennis Hurley Center. It's every little has helped. It just amazed me that Haley was such a force in designing urban spaces. We are working to make that space a precinct, a holy precinct, recognized by UNESCO, where people can be judged in terms of the inner human dignity, irrespective of their conditions. Our nearest neighbor is the mosque, the Juma Mosque, and these two buildings have been here for over a hundred years with no quarrel ever happening between the two faiths and I mean we're separated by about five meters of road so we've been very close to each other and um, Archbishop Hurley when he was here used to go and pray in the mosque especially after 9-11 when he felt that there was going to be a lot of tension between Muslims and Christians. He would just go quietly there early in the morning and sit in a corner and pray while people were chanting from the Quran. The idea of bringing the faith together. So we've got the mosque there, we've got the Gandhi Library across the road, we've got the Victoria Street Market, we've got the Surat Hindu Association building, and now the new Gandhi Memorial being built. 
So this is a uniquely interfaith neighborhood. And um, that, that was another element of the, um, of the idea of the Dennis Hurdy Center. Some of the first money coming in came from the mosque, came from the Muslim community. He was able to give him himself to a lot of people. And in my association and connection with the Dennis Hurley Center, I'm always amazed and humbled about how many people um, were touched personally by Uncle Dennis. When people came to him and said, Baba, we haven't got any jobs, he said, come with me. And he showed them the mall. He said, you can put your stalls there and you can sell fruit and vegetables there. So they're there because of him. You know, it, it's, it's untidy, it doesn't look terribly nice next to a cathedral, but for him, the value of life, life and survival, would be more important than neatness and respectability. So this was a, a way in which he could create some jobs, some, some way of helping people. Serving as a beacon of hope to the poor, lighting the lamp of education for the disadvantaged, and basking in the glory of interfaith unity, it is here that the light of the Archbishop continues to burn brightly. Just days before his death, in a conversation with Father Wilhelm Steckling, Archbishop Hurley said, You know, more and more I realize that love is the only thing that matters. Love makes the difference. Paul said that out of faith, hope and love, love is the most important. Sometimes we want to turn it around, saying that faith comes first. We should return to the original message. Give love the place of honor. Love is the distinguishing mark of the Christian. The values are that you sensed resonated in Haley was a deep sense of purpose. He ignited the sense of purpose, the deep respect for human dignity, irrespective of anything, dignity as a God in people, and um, courage not to be intimidated or to be absorbed in counter-reactionary forces. Uh, the people gathered here, and the people of the city, we present this to you in deep and immense gratitude for all that you have done for our great and wonderful land. Alan Payton once wrote, Dennis Hurley was not born in a lighthouse, as some people imagine. His father was the keeper of the lighthouse. The lighthouse has become a symbol of light and hope. Dennis Hurley has been doing this work of warning and guiding for the greater part of his life. And he has done it with great faithfulness. He certainly gave so much and who continues in his memory to make sure that our country is a better place. Um, I was the family member who was very privileged to be with him within an hour or two of him losing his beloved sister Eileen. And we sat together at her bedside and prayed. And his gentle kindness to me in my own grief, and then his profound faith at that moment of his own intense grief to me remains an inspiring experience of love, of faith, of spirituality. Interestingly, he came here again to where he had started in 1940. You know, he could have chosen any parish he could have chosen a much smaller job, chose to come here, which is probably the hardest job in the diocese. You, I mean, you see the surroundings, 
the problems that are here. You know, he's kind of, he was surrounded by a sea of poverty here and that's where he wanted to be. And he stayed here for nearly 10 years till he was 86 or so, yeah. So a remarkable thing, he was, for the first time in his whole life, he was a parish priest. He had never been a parish priest. You do all that before you become a bishop. He did it afterwards. And he wanted to, to make this parish, uh, you know, a parish that was very interested in social outreach. He's one of the people that made us believe that being a Christian and serving the people means being truthful and being fearless right through. He often bespeaks a man who was solidly rooted in his spirituality, didn't ever ever waver from that, but was able then to express it in a way that, that, that made an impact on the world. And that for me is perhaps the best example, it's a Christ-like example, and, and maybe that's the best way, you know, the incarnate Christ in different places, and that for me was Archbishop Dennis Hurley in many ways. God gave each one of us a very, very precious gift, the gift of choice. We can choose what we want to do, who we want to be, how we want to do it. We can choose good or evil. We can choose right or wrong. We can see different ways to be good and evil. We can see different ways to do right and wrong. But we are told by our sages, the one thing we should always choose and this comes from the very first books in the Torah. Choose life. Choose life. Because life is about living in the best possible way. Giving in the best possible way. And making a difference and making a better world. And that's what the arch did.